Good morning. It's Terrific Tuesday. We're on May the 22nd, 2018 for our one year Bible study. And it's like the last two weeks readings is just culminating in today's reading. It's like everything that God's been speaking to me, it's, it's like he summarizes it in today's reading in 1 Samuel. I, I'm sorry, we start 2 Samuel uh, chapters 1 and 2 today. And so in yesterday's reading, if you remember, uh, Saul and Jonathan was killed in battle. Today is the day that the messenger comes to tell David that both Saul and Jonathan are dead. So let's just recap what we know from the last couple of weeks of reading. So Saul was the first king. God didn't want the Israelites to have a king, but they insisted. So he gave them Saul. And Saul started immediately rebell rebelling. Uh, he had a lot of success in, uh, in the beginning in the wars and stuff that he was doing. He killed a, a lot of the enemies and stuff and won over a lot of the people. But, but even in the midst of those wars, in the midst of him doing good things, he built his own altar, did his own burnt offering, didn't wait on Samuel. Um, and then during another war, when God had instructed him, told him that he would have favor and he would win, but he was to destroy everyone, everything, and Saul does just the opposite. He lets Agog live, and he brings back all of the plunder, all of the best of the best of all the other things. Uh, we see that rebellion in Saul. So, because of God's anger towards that, because of his disobedience, God selects and anoints David to be the replacement for Saul. So here we have a king that has his kingdom, that's had some success, and he rebels against God, and so God selects and anoints and makes known that David's the replacement and then right smack dab in the middle of these two people, we have Saul's son, Jonathan. And I told you several days ago that God was speaking to me about relationships in these readings. And so what we got to see in one day's reading about a week or so ago was 12 attempts, at least 12 attempts that Saul took trying to kill David. Then we saw, we saw, King Saul turned against his son, Jonathan, and he threw a spear at him, tried to kill him. And then we read about how the tormenting spirits come on Saul. And, um, and David remains faithful. <clears throat> so then after that, there's more attempts. David gets the opportunity on several occasions that he could have killed Saul, uh, who was trying to kill him. So you, you you see the picture? I'm summarizing it all. Because here we are today, and not one time has David turned against Jonathan. Not one time has David turned against Saul. And Jonathan's dad, King Saul, is trying to kill David. And King Saul himself is trying to kill David. And, and this has been going on and on to the point that David's exiled from his uh, homeland he can't even be back home because he's had to be on the run, uh, being chased by Saul. I mean, he, he gave up everything, everything. I mean, just think about where you live today and, and, and what, what possessions you have, whether you have great possessions or you just have a bag full of things. Um, they're yours. And nobody likes to have those things ripped away from us. Nobody wants to be forced out of your home, much less your homeland, into a foreign country. And that's what happened to David. Uh, I mean, you want to name just about every bad thing that could happen, happened to David because of Saul. And today, the messenger comes and tells David that King Saul is dead and that his son Jonathan died. And his response is, that David himself kills this messenger and says, how dare you touch God's anointed one? Now there is so much packed into that one statement. How dare you touch God's anointed one? See, he was honoring Saul, but he was honoring God. 
because God had anointed Saul as king, David honored the man Saul as king. If we could just do one one hundred of loyalty that David showed, we could avoid wars, we could we could avoid feuds and fusses and churches splitting and family splitting and I mean <clears throat> this just it impacts me every time I read it but I think it's impacted me this year even more and I and I can't even tell you guys I really know exactly why it's impacted me so much um, and I'm listening just thought maybe God was speaking to me right then but it's really impacted me this year so David and his men, so it wasn't just David, but, but listen to what David's leadership brought about. David and his men tore their clothes in sorrow when they heard the news. They mourned and wept and fasted all day for Saul and his son Jonathan, for the Lord's army and the nation of Israel, because they had died by the sword that day. Were you not afraid to kill the Lord's anointed one? He said, wow. Then David composed a funeral song for Saul and Jonathan. So he wrote a song for him. So he goes into a deep mourning for the very man who was trying to kill him. And the very man that was keeping him from office. I mean, can you imagine? Just think about our presidential elections and how they come at each other. The only thing keeping David from being king is Saul. And he wrote a funeral song for him. Hmm. And in the middle of that song, in verse 26, this is David's words. How I weep for you, my brother Jonathan. Oh, how much I loved you. And your love for me was deep, deeper than the love of a woman. Now that's true friendship right there. That is loyalty. That is how relationships should be done. But I want to remind you again, it wasn't a relationship for the sake of a relationship with Jonathan. It wasn't a relationship based on the relationship for the sake of Saul. It was, it was God honor, uh, David honoring God. If, if, the, if we will put God first in every relationship we have, that relationship will be so much richer, so much deeper. There will be so much less backstabbing, so much less betrayal um, if we make all relationships centered on God and not centered on our, oh, well, I like this person. I, I mean, we were just talking as we were starting the recording about how grateful I am with the comfort and the love that I have with the people here at this table with me because... I can be myself and and you know and, and I, I looked at Spencer and I told him how much I feel loved when I'm in his presence and you know but you know what this relationship these relationships here at this table are all centered on God and I wouldn't give all of the gold in the world for the way we love and honor each other it's special and and I'm so grateful that I'm learning how to be a better friend I'm learning how to be a better mother I'm learning how to be a better wife because I pick up this Bible every single day, I'm learning to even understand myself better and probably more important than all of that is I'm learning to love myself better and the most important thing is I'm learning to love God and allow God to love me even more. Um, so this was something and you know what? It cost David. So it goes on after the funeral song and uh, Judah anoints David as king of Judah, but another faction anoints one of Saul's son um, as Ishibosheth. Ish I hope I said that right. Saul's son was 40 years old when he became king, and he ruled for two years. So the the kingdom was divided at this point. It wasn't one king, but but the um, Saul followers made Saul's son a king of that land and David was king of just Judah and um, 
It, David made, made Hebron his capital, and he ruled as king of, king of Judah for seven and a half years. So it was seven and a half years before the divided kingdom was no longer divided. So it cost David a lot to stay faithful to both Jonathan and Saul. Hmm. Just, I just want you to think about your relationships. I want you to think about your actions. How much mercy do you show to those around you? Do you show enough mercy that they could throw a spear at you and you wouldn't remove yourself from them? Do you have enough grace towards them that as they make their mistakes, you still love them? Or are you criticizing their every word? Are you criticizing their every mood? Uh, uh, every move that they make is wrong. I, how are you about the relationships in your life? And I just want to encourage you, this isn't for condemnation purposes. This is for the edifying of the church and for you to turn your eyes right back on God concerning every relationship that you have and let God write everything here on earth. Moves right into John uh, chapter 12, verses 20 through 50. <clears throat> Jesus is telling them in verse 23, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. These next several chapters in the book of John mm, is how come the book of John is one of my favorite, if not the favorite chapter in the Bible for me. Uh, book in the Bible. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels. <clears throat> a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. You know, again, the people at this table and I over the last few weeks have not just talked about releasing something and letting it go and then watching the glory of God show up. Um, we've had to do it. I mean, we've just literally had to say, oh, I take my hands off that. I can't fix it. I wasn't supposed to fix it. I can't influence it. I'm not supposed to influence it. I just give it back to God. I release it and I lose all control and I want no control of the outcome of how that uh, worked. And oh my goodness, the stories we have to tell. Um, major, major praise reports. Oh, I, I, I probably better not get off on some of those stories. <laughs> um, so Jesus goes on and says, Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my soul is deeply, deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But for this very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. So he's preparing the disciples for what's getting ready to happen. From this point into the next several uh, chapters of this book, he's telling them. He wants them to know. He's telling them in advance so they'll be prepared so that they won't be surprised uh, by the things that's going to happen. Then uh, Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine, because, um, let me back up, because I want you to know what the voice was about. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name, and I will do so again. And then Jesus told them, that voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of the world, will be cast out. Do you understand what that is? The time has come and it is now when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. When Jesus fulfilled all that he came to earth to do and he said those words, it is finished, the devil was cast out. See, we give the devil way too much credit and we, and we let him have power. The only power he has in our lives is the power that we're willing to give him. Rise up, grab him by the jawbone, and club him to death. I still remember that scripture. That's what we should be doing instead of cowering and being fearful. Oh my goodness, I've got, I'm, under, I'm under attack again. There's another attack on me. Um, no, 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 no. He's been defeated. It is finished. We'll, we'll get to that reading uh, here before long. 
And then I started writing in the margins already. Over at verse um, 44, Jesus shouted to the crowds, If you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. And in, in my margin, I wrote in capital letters, O-N-E, one, one. I'm telling you, a Bible study, a word study on the word one and the word all will change your life forever. It did mine. I didn't speak on my own authority, Jesus said. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commandments leads to eternal life. So I say whatever the Father tells me to say. <laughs> We're still in Psalms 118 too. And um, I, I, yesterday I was telling you guys why I believe God hears every prayer I pray. And why I believe he answers them. And I, I again in Psalms 118, I, how can I doubt it when, when the Bible says, I thank you for answering my prayer and giving me victory? It, how much more plain can it be that he answers our prayers? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Mm, it's a terrific Tuesday, y'all. So thank you so much for joining me, and I hope these words has uh, penetrated your heart and that we all stop and really, really think about our relationships. So thank you.